Hi everybody, welcome to my Skardo for April 2021. Don't forget, we're now in British summertime, so you'll need to add an hour to all the time shown in the Skardo if you're in the UK, because all the time shown are universal time in the Skardo. So everything's drawn for universal time. So don't forget to take that into account when you're uh, going out there to have a look. OK, if you find my Skydiver useful, please, please, please like my videos and, of course, subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. OK, the Skydiver is available on Team Up. So if you go to www.star-gazing.co.uk forward slash diary, you can see the diary there. So there's three parts to the diary. There's the blue one, which shows you all the uh, times of events happening in the sky. So this is basically the sky die I've got now showing in tabular form. And you can download it and carry it around with you. You've also got uh, the red one, which is all about events that I find out are happening. I'll add them in there so you can have details to join in those virtual or real events that are going on when we're allowed to have them, of course. And then there's the black one, which is lots of space anniversaries and all sorts of other things related to space flight, which I'm gradually filling up. And you can carry this around with you. It's on Team Up. And if you go to the web page, star-gazing.co.uk forward slash diary, you'll be able to download the app and all the instructions are there on how to add it. So you can carry it around with you wherever you go. So enjoy. Don't forget, everyone's welcome to join us at the Virtual Astronomy Club. We're trying to keep astronomy sociable during these uh, difficult times for everybody. So just go and join us on the first and the third Tuesdays of the month at 7 p.m. British Summer Time. That's 6 p.m. Universal Time if you're joining us from overseas. And all details are on the website virtual-astro-club.com. So hope to see you there soon okay let's have a look at what's happening in the sky this month so just the general constellations that are on view this is the view middle of the month at about 10 o'clock in the evening so this is looking north where the circumpolar constellations are and you can see ursa minor there just below ursa major and ursa major and the plow or the big dipper for our american friends is virtually overhead at this time of the year and you've got draco the dragon meandering between the two bears and then the opposite direction from the plow to the other side of polaris you've got the m or w shape of cassiopeia here it is here and then next door you've got king cepheus and then looking towards the south in the opposite direction these are the stars that are at their highest of course so Orion is just starting to disappear so that's over in the west but we we'll talk about that in a little while and Canis Minor just over here Cancer fairly high up still at the moment and then Hydra just below that and on the back of Hydra you've got Crater the Cup and Corvus the Crow but of course the constellations that are really at their best at this time of the year during the spring are Leo Coma Berenices and Virgo. Of course, this whole region is absolutely splattered with lots and lots and lots of galaxies because we're looking out of the Milky Way towards intergalactic space um, because the Milky Way is out of the way at the moment. It's almost at the horizon at the moment. We'll see that in a moment. So have a look around here. Look, lots of galaxies. And then Bertie's here with the bright star Arcturus over here. And then if we look towards the west, these are the constellations that are setting. So all the winter stars are starting to disappear. There's Orion, Betelgeuse, just visible as it goes over the horizon. Taurus here, and of course we've got Mars. Mars is gradually slipping into the twilight, so it will soon be gone. Perseus over here, starting to disappear. Auriga, a little bit higher up in the sky, as is Canis Minor and Gemini, the twins. Cancer going to take a little bit longer to disappear and then if we look towards the east these are the constellations that are rising already said about virgo coma brenesis ursa major and ursa minor and draco of course and then you've got hercules down here and Bertis, the herdsman and in between those you've got corona borealis the northern crown 
and then the Fucus just starting to rise over in the east there. But in the northeast, you've got these two really bright first magnitude stars appearing, Vega in Lyra and Deneb in Cygnus. Of course, the summer triangle is starting to rise. Here's the Milky Way starting to rise. So as we approach summer, we're going to get a lovely view of the Milky Way. OK, so let's have a look at the planets. Mercury is at superior conjunction on the 19th of the month. Western elongation was on March the 6th. But it's next going to be seen later in the month in the evening sky and eastern elongation actually occurs on the 17th of May. So that's next month. Venus is fairly close to the sun um, in the evening sky, but it is getting a little bit higher and higher each evening. Um, so we should be able to see it by the end of the month. Superior conjunction was on March the 26th, but it is gradually moving further away from the sun. So it may be spotted, as I say, towards the end of the month. And then eastern elongation is going to be on October the 29th. So it's going to take a long time to reach that eastern elongation. Mars is visible in the evening sky still, but it's not anywhere near like it was as good last year. Uh, it's visible as a first magnitude star, but it really doesn't stand out quite as much as it did last year. Jupiter and Saturn both low in the morning eastern sky. Uranus is visible in Aries. It's just about visible to the naked eye. Not quite, but uh, you'll need a really dark sky, but it's easy to pick up in binoculars or a small telescope. And Neptune lost in the evening twilight and the moon's close by on the 13th, but that's going to be really difficult to see Neptune because it is so deep in the twilight. So I'm not going to mention that in any great detail during this diary. Okay, well, one other solar system object is Vesta, which is just past opposition. It was our opposition last month, and that's visible in the southern sky all night. It's still visible moving through Leo. So here's Leo. Here's the sickle of Leo, the back to front question mark here, and then the bright first magnitude star Regulus right at the bottom of the sickle there. And then in the tail of Leo, you've got the nebula, which is this star here. And here's the trail of Vesta as it moves through the body of Leo. It's magnitude 6.5, so it's not quite easily visible to the naked eye, but it's still nice and bright. Uh, but it is relatively easy to find using binoculars or a small telescope as a star-like point. Here it is in a bit closer detail. So you can see here, the positions are shown at two day intervals. So here's the position on the 1st of April and every two days it's plotted and you can see on the 30th of April, it's here. So it's done this little loop as the earth does this retrograde loop on the motion of Vesta. OK, so 1st of April, one of the things to look out for is the moon near Antares. Here's Antares, the lovely red giant star in Scorpius. Here it is, here's Scorpius and its tail sort of meandering down into the southern hemisphere, which we can't see. But here's the uh, gibbous moon visible near Antares at about four o'clock in the morning. And it passes north of Antares while it's below the horizon. And if you get up the next day on the second, you'll see that the moon's moved a little bit across from Antares. Um, but it should look quite nice. On the 4th of April, the moon's at last quarter. Uh, so that's when real deep sky stuff starts to be enjoyed because we're going to get some really dark skies with the moon starting to get out of the way. 6th of April, you might just about be able to see if you get up in the morning and look towards the southeastern sky about five o'clock in the morning. The moon's going to be close to Jupiter and Saturn. So there's Jupiter and there's Saturn, but it's really low down. As you can see, I've had to put in the sea horizon and get rid of my new horizon, my usual horizon, because they are too low to be seen with all the um, trees and everything that's in my view. But you can see there 
that uh, if you've got a really low southeastern horizon, you should be able to see the Moon, Jupiter and Saturn in the twilight just before sunrise at about five o'clock in the morning. And the Moon is at new on the 12th, so around about mid-month is nice dark skies for everybody interested in deep sky observing and imaging. And then on the 13th of April, we start to see the moon appear as a very, very thin crescent over here in the evening sky. And this is about 7.41 universal time. You might be able to see the Pleiades and the Hyades. Now Orion is getting lower there, but it's a really, really thin crescent moon with some really nice earth shine. The next evening, the moon's moved a little bit higher. There's crescent is just that little bit thicker but it's starting to approach the Hyades and the Pleiades star cluster as it goes and that's about 741 universal time and then the next night well I've left this a little bit later so we've got a bit of a darker sky the moon is nicely nestled in between the Hyades and the Pleiades again it's still a fairly thin crescent but it should have some really really nice earth shine because it's quite high at a later time of the evening, we should be able to see that Earth shine really, really nicely on the Moon's disk. And then the next night, on the 16th of April, again about 8 o'clock in the evening, you can see that uh, the Moon's moved past the Hyades and the Pleiades, and it's now approaching Mars just up here, which is moving slowly in that direction, but it's going to lose the fight with the twilight over the next few weeks. The next night on the 17th of April, Mars is very close to the Moon, so that should be a good identification for those of you who are struggling to work out which one Mars is. And that's about eight o'clock in the evening over in the West. So have a look and see if you can see the Moon nestled really close to Mars. 19th of April, daytime sky, Mercury is, reaches superior conjunction. This means it's on the opposite side of the sun, so it's around the other side of the sun. But don't try and observe it because it's far too close to the sun. You're not going to be able to observe it. So please don't get out there and try and look for it because, you know, the sun is very dangerous. And unless you're using correct filtration, you can't see anything anyway. And that same day, on the 19th of April, the Lunar X is visible. Trouble is, it's going to be a daytime sky, as you can see here. This is a clear obscure effect, and the best time, according to Mary McIntyre's astronomy blog, which is down here, uh, the best time is about 11 o'clock in the morning. So it is going to be in the daytime sky. And it's made up of the ramparts of... Blancius, Lacau, and Purbach craters. Here it is here. So here's the lunar cross or lunar X here. And you can see you've got the three craters, Purbach, Lacau, and Blancius here. And they make up the ramparts. And as the sun's rising over them, they create this, it creates this lovely cross effect as they poke into the sunlight. But it doesn't last for long, only lasts for a couple of hours. And at around the same time, you've got the lunar V, which is visible in the southern part of Malvopurim, close to Rima Hyginus. So here it is here. So there's the lunar V catching the sun's rays just at sunrise. And you can see there's Rima Hyginus, Agrippa, Goding, Trisnecker, and Ryticus craters nearby as well. So have a look out for those because they're well worth looking out for. And on the 20th, you've got the first quarter moon. So the moon's getting a bit thicker. It's getting a bit brighter. So your deep sky opportunities are going to get a little bit worse unless you get up in the early hours of the morning around this time. But on the same evening in the western sky, the moon moves just above Pricepe, the beehive star cluster, Messier number 44. And you see the moon here and the star cluster here. I've exaggerated the scale of the moon just so you can see it a little bit clearer. And then on 21st and 22nd, the moon passes north of Regulus and Leo. Again, this is Leo. This is the sickle of Leo. And down here, you've got Regulus, the bright star in leo and here's the moon on the evening of the 21st at around 10 o'clock at night universal time don't forget and then 
On the 22nd, you can see how far the moon's moved from here to here throughout that 24 hours. So it's passed above Regulus and you can see it getting thicker and thicker and more gibbous as time goes by. On the 22nd, we've got the maximum of the April Lyrid meteor shower. Now, this is a shower that's active between the 4th and the 30th of April. So it's actually active throughout the whole month. Uh, but the maximum on the 22nd is when it's at its best. There's only 15 meteors per hour. And this ZHR, this zenithal hourly rate, is only an approximation and it can never be as high as the number quoted unless the radiant the position where the meteors come from which is here just in lyra just between lyra and hercules here the only reason that would be 15 per hour is if it was directly over your head and that's very rarely the radiant of a meteor shower is going to be directly over your head when it's running so you expect to see a few less meteors than that per hour 25th the evening south eastern sky at about 11 o'clock you should be able to see the moon passing spiker in virgo here's spiker here's virgo and it's nearly full at this stage and then of course 27th is when it is exactly full so that's when our deep sky observing is going to be almost non-existent unless you're doing narrowband imaging of course and that's on the 27th on the 29th in the morning southern sky about three o'clock in the morning the moon again passes north of antares so it passed here earlier in the month and now it's passing through again in scorpius there in the southern sky at three o'clock in the morning and then on the 30th at about 1 43 a.m the moon actually goes in front of and occults the star theta ophiuchi and that means the moon moves in front of and blocks that distant star. Here you can see where the moon is. It's quite low down in the south. And again, that's about quarter to two in the morning. Here's a bit of a closer view. So you can see this is the view from my location at 1.43 universal time. So it'll be 2.43 British summer time. OK. It disappears from 1.30, dependent on your location in the UK, and it reappears on the opposite side about an hour later. OK, and the exact timings of that will depend on your location to so make sure you get out and watch it. And when you do see that star disappear or reappear, which is a bit more difficult to judge where it's going to appear from, you will see probably the most instantaneous thing you'd ever seen, because when the star is occulted by the moon, it blinks off instantly and then reappears exactly the same when the limb cuts off the light from the star. Uh, but again, exact times will depend on your location, but it's from around 1.30 onwards and it lasts for about an hour. And then very last end of the month, Venus and Mercury may be visible just after sunset, but they are really, really low down in the sky. There is the western horizon and northwestern horizon. Um, and this is the view at 10 to 8 in the evening, universal time. So the bright one is Venus and the fainter one is Mercury. So that's your best chance of seeing them this month. So get out there and have a look. One last thing to mention is Comet Leonard, which is going to be visible. I do have another video showing what I think might happen, but you can never tell with comets. Um, so this shows the path in 10 day intervals. So you can see the constellations here, Canis Venatici, Ursa Major and Bertes. And you've got Dubé and Merak here, the two pointers of, of the plough. And here's where the comet was on the 1st of January. 1st of February it's moved here, 1st of March. So here it is, 1st of April. And here it is on the 1st of May. So you can see it's just approaching the bowl of the plough, but it is quite faint. It's going to carry around and then August, September, October, November and December. But this is the exciting bit when it's going to get a little bit brighter and start to move faster as it approaches the Earth and it approaches the sun. But I talk about that in my other video. So have a look for that one. And of course, I'll be talking about it in subsequent Sky Diaries uh, as we get further into the year. 
but of course during April it's around about 13th or 14th magnitude so it is quite faint so I'm going to once the moon's out of the way and I get a good clear dark night I'm going to try and see if I can pick this up and watch it developing throughout the year so that's going to be a little project for me this year don't forget the virtual astronomy club trying to keep astronomy sociable is running the first and third tuesdays of every month at 7 p.m that's british summertime don't forget so it'll be 6 p.m universal time and that's virtual stroke astro stroke club dot com so everyone's welcome to come and join us okay don't forget if you find my sky diary useful please like the video and of course subscribe to my youtube channel so take care folks and i'll see you next time bye bye